Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the FIDE Grand Prix. Today is day six or round six in the preliminary stage. And after today, we will know who mathematically has set themselves up for a spot in the candidates. Ricard report from Hungary, about a 98% lock. So it's really up to Hikaru, Levon, Aparian, Anish Giri over in Group D has to play for a win. Who's gonna make it from anywhere else? I don't know, but here we go, folks. We're about to have some fun. Uh, we're gonna kick things off with the other matchup in um, in Group uh, in Group A. This is between Aparian and Levon, and um, Aparian is uh, is playing for uh, a spot in the group as well. He has two and a half points out of five. So he's gonna try to put the pressure on Levon who has three points. Levon's looking at Hikaru's game who also has three points and he's like, do I play for a win? Do I play for a draw? Levon decides I'm gonna play DC4 in the Catalan. Abidin plays the Catalan. I mean, the Catalan, if you need an opening that's gonna win or draw, you play the Catalan. Uh, we have DC4 and C5. now. Playing like this, this is a very mainline Catalan position to put the knight behind the C-pawn to apply more pressure to the white position. Uh, here, white can play DC5 and basically play a position where after bishop C5, knight BD2, and black sacrificing this pawn, um, white is always better, but generally black can hold. We actually saw Pragnananda, very, you know, obviously talented and famous Indian youngster, defeat Dingli Ren from the black side of this position in a recent online event. Do you not remember that? That's completely fine. I'm just, you know, I'm not like I'm not the teacher that like says something. He's like, ah, did you read? Ah, uh, yeah, I did the reading. Ha ha ha. That was me in school. Hopefully it's you as well. Queen A4 though, <clears throat> played by Grigori Aparin. Grigori uh, puts some pressure here on this diagonal. Uh, he obviously steps out of the way of this being taken. We have Bishop D7 and the other idea is to scoop this pawn up. Now, Levon plays B5. This is a very aggressive move. You cannot take this pawn because you are walking directly into this. So, Queen D3 and Queen D1. And you might say, wow, this is completely idiotic. Why would Aparin waste so many queen moves just to return home? Well, if we compare the last time the queen was on the d1 square, notice the structure of the black position. He has made Levon make a bunch of moves and commit to certain things. And now what white is going to do after they finish their development is going to be lock up the queen side with a move like a3 uh, and then, you know, play uh, play either for two pawns in the middle and opening up the board. Maybe the knight goes to e5, maybe d5, knight goes to c3. And Levon's like, no, g5. I have to win this game. I'm gonna try to get aggressive. Let's play this in an aggressive style. Uh, I'm gonna hold together my queen side. I'm castling, here we go. Now, white is better here. Uh, white is better because against such a classical and solid opening as the Catalan, you just can't play h6, g5. That just doesn't work. You can't play like that. Can't do that, all right? Um, but how is a Python gonna take advantage of it? Well, he's gonna play knight e5. I just talked about this move. now. If black here moves the knight out of the way, white could take the bishop and basically just say, I have the two bishops, but it's actually better to keep the knight here. I mean, the knight is just really good. You can just build up the rooks behind it and maybe even play a four in the future, rip open the king side. So he takes and he moves his knight back and a Biden plays f4. Now here, Levon has to take on f4 and then play f6. If he doesn't take and then play f6, if he just, you know, plays like the knight around to c7, then what's gonna happen is f takes g5, the knight will go to f6, and white is gonna win the game. So a Biden just has a one-way ticket. And this is why you can't fight back against such solid openings like the Catalan with garbage. g5 is not quite garbage, but it's, I mean, you know, you can't be too aggressive against the Catalan. It's a really good opening. But he plays f6 like this. And the problem is that this version with f takes e5 allows the following dynamite strike. Bishop, oh my, a5. And now if the queen takes, we are getting into d7. After we get into d7, we take everything. And you can't do anything. If you play queen e7, I follow you right back, and now it's even worse. So bishop a5, and he takes on d7. He takes on g5. The pawns are doubled. The bishop is blocked in. The knight is going to join the queen and attack the king. Folks, this game is over. It is a plus 7 advantage for Grigori Aparin, who even gives away a pawn with check to hide his king. And this man swarms Levon. It's like when you drop a fighter in UFC and you just go all in. Rook d6, the white king completely safe. The knight is pried away from the defense of the black position. The knight comes into e6 and Levon resigns because mates from all over the place are unstoppable, including rook h6 for queen h7. 
And Grigory Aparin has leapfrogged Levan Aranyan for first place in the group. But over to the side, Hikaru Nakamura is playing against Yesipenko. And obviously, he is also looking to make a statement. Will he win this game? Will he draw this game? He plays a Bishop's opening, and Yesipenko plays actually uh, a Vienna line. We are now kind of in a Vienna where White has given away the light squared Bishop uh, and goes for this kind of a position with b3. I've played this with White, and sometimes here I will play a Bishop to g5 or a Knight to g3, and I'll just go for a very big attack. I'll play g4, put a knight on f5, but black is always fast enough with counterplay in the middle if he's smart. So Yesipenko just castles, this time preparing for the correct opponent, by the way, and he decides to begin expanding on the queen side. Hikaru stops that advancement and then puts a bishop on g5, looking to make a trade and leave white with no bishops. So basically no pieces that can attack, uh, that can attack a little bit, you know, in a long range kind of situation. Uh, g6, trying to kick the knight out. Now c6 to make sure none of the knights can go to d5. But white is always a little bit better in this structure. White is better because black just doesn't really have any forward movement. I mean, f5 is possible. You could play f5 now. But maybe Hikaru doesn't want to play this for a win. Because remember, this is move 17. You look at move 17 on the other board. Maybe we don't want to take too much risk. So Yesipenko begins slowly building up the pressure. And he gets a very nice position. He's sacrificing the pawn on a5. Hikaru takes it, but all of a sudden, a roaring initiative approaches Hikaru's king, and this is very bad news, because if he loses and uh, Aparin wins against Levon, Aparin wins the group. Levon and Hikaru have three. Aparin takes over. So here comes the initiative. Knight f5, look at this. The knight is going. Knight d5. Yesipenko sacrifices two knights in a row because there's this, right? Maybe even EF5 would have been good. Sacks two knights in a row, and Hikaru politely declines taking both of them. Now, in this position, apparently B4 or C3, which are stockfish moves, are good for white. Also, Queen F2. But Yesipenko thinks for a bit and plays Queen F2. He plays Queen F2. And suddenly, Hikaru plays a move that looks completely not possible. He lashes out with the thing in his position that's being completely surrounded, like a, like a jailbreak in a movie scene, F5. What? And now we have problems, because Andre does not have a lot of time on the clock to make the remaining 13 moves. It's move 27, he's gotta make 13 moves. He begins trying to deal with Hikaru's counterplay, who now does take the knight, but with the bishop, and plays knight h5. He has sacrificed that pawn temporarily, he hasn't taken it back, to try to put his knight on f4. Right? Yesipenko plays rookie one, the queen goes back, now the knight's gotta go. Now here comes Hikaru's knight. Yesipenko desperately sacrifices the rook for the knight and does look like he has a good position. But black is in time to defend everything. And now if you trade the rooks here, it's 0-0-0. Zero, zero, zero. So the position is actually equal. Black does have a lot of threats. White is also threatening some expansion, but black is quick enough. Yesipenko thinks on move 35. Five moves until the 40th move. And that's it. How do you break through this? The pawn can't move forward. If the pawn can't move forward, you can't attack with anything. Yesipenko plays king h1. Here come Hikaru's pieces. And after knight e3, danger levels from Hikaru. Counter attack on the queen. The attack has fallen. The pieces of white are being thrown backwards. Queen e4 a check is coming. Andrei Yesipenko resigns. Hikaru wins his group with four out of six after starting with a loss to Levon, a draw against Yesipenko, and a totally lost position against Grigory Aparin, saving the day and winning three games on demand. Number 11 in the world he is now. He wins the group, and mathematically speaking, he has officially eliminated everybody else in this field. He is the man in the candidates. Now, you guys can tell me if you still want Grand Prix recaps. They should probably stop playing. But we have an entire recap here. Don't go anywhere. There is still so much drama. You are not ready for this. All right? You are absolutely not ready for what's about to... Uh, it's completely insane, by the way. Can we just... One more time. Hikaru is in the candidates. What? And he can't even give a spot up to Ding Li Ren because Ding Li Ren is trying to make the candidates by playing 30 games in 30 days in China. Did you know that? No? Do you come to this channel for news? Maybe I should make a video about Ding Li Ren's quest to the candidates. Should I? Let me know in the comments. Upload other people's comments. All right. We take a quick detour to Group B. Mamidyarov is leading Group B. So what does he do? He makes a 10-move draw against Dubov by repeating moves. I don't know how you feel about that. 
It's not 10, but they drew in 10 moves and then repeated until move 13. So Mamid Yarov gets his extra half a point. Now he's going to go look over there as Vincent Keimer with white is half a point behind Linier. If Linier wins, he wins the group. But nobody cares because Hikaru is also potentially making the candidates, right? So Linier plays a Queen's Gambit accepted. We have a very classical line from Keimer who sets up his forces in this opening in a very stoic way. Doesn't look like white has anything powerful coming. But here, Vincent Keimer goes absolutely ballistic. All right? Absolutely ballistic. Queen B1, knight E4, and just begins the attacking process. Lanier here completely underestimates the white initiative as the queen comes in. The knight comes into E5. All of the white forces are, defended, are, are, are being defended against by a bishop. Keimer is just, it's a green light into the black position. But Lanier starts countering. Knight takes E3. You cannot take this because queen e3 is a fork. But danger levels. Bishop drops back to d4. Now when you take my queen, I take your queen, there's a rook and a knight hanging. So what do you do? You have to sacrifice the rook. Lanier has a bishop and a pawn for a rook. Vincent now puts his rook on the open file. We have a trade of rooks. And Vincent has to win this position against the seasoned grandmaster. Look at this. Giving up the a2 pawn because his rook can get in. And trap the bishop. Tragic. e5. Bishop is activated, but so are all the white pieces. Excuse me. Bishop b3, bishop d5, and Keimer correctly understands that even though these pawns are here, this bishop is not participating in the game. That bishop is ceramic, all right? It actually has nothing. It's not good for anything. f6, e6, if g6, the knight is going to come in, and Keimer ends this game in style by combining his three most powerful assets of rook, knight, and pass pawn, and swarming... And he wins the game in emphatic style by playing the move g5 and e7. And black resigns because if he takes with the bishop, it's a mate. It's a double check and a mate. And if he takes with the knight, then check. The bishop is stuck and the game is over. And the game is absolutely over. And he has caught up with Mamid Yarov to win Group C and play a playoff. I believe they play a playoff tomorrow, all right? Uh, in Group B. Did I say Group C? In Group B. In Group C, Wesley So trying to, uh, you know, playing with white. It's a, it's a Rui. It's a, it's a classical Rui. Uh, we have the Zaitsev system from Pretke. Wesley has to win or draw. So he's taking a long, hard look at that other game as this Rui is going on. And, uh, well, first we have a trade in the middle, right? We have uh, Wesley getting a bishop pair here. And if anybody's playing this for anything, it's white. White is better because white has the light squared bishop. That bishop is going to be useful here, going to be useful here. <coughs> I have to sneeze. Sorry, I'm allergic to having uh, no light squared bishop. And in this case, Prete doesn't have one. Uh, I'm also allergic to tree pollen. Bishop c6, queen a2. Rook c1, and Wesley's doing exactly what Wesley's trying to do here. He's trying to apply that pressure on the c-file, and he's got a very pleasant position. He opts for a queen trade. Predka declines, so I'm going to keep expanding on the queen side. All right, we have a little dance here. No repetition of moves just yet. Wesley's got to find a way forward. He plays h4, bishop c6. Now his queen... like it, it, Wesley's just making incremental improvements, but now queen g4, and Predka plays g5. And this goes all the way back... Look at this. Wesley moved one pawn on the opposite side of the board, and Pretka immediately went there. The board vision of these guys is unreal. Apparently, Wesley, instead of h3, h4, uh, had to play for you know, pressure here, try to expand with b5 and try to break apart this defense. But the second that Pretka goes over here and gets counterplay, uh, now, you know, Wesley decides to actually swap off the queens, but Pretka's too quick. One bad pawn move by Wesley, and the counterplay began. We have a mass simplification. We have a draw uh, in this endgame because the bishop and the two pawns will just very easily counteract the rook. I know it's a little bit confusing, but I promise it's the case. And Wesley makes a draw, and he now awaits the conclusion of the other game between Shankland and MVL. And uh, Shankland also needs to win or draw, so he plays into a Grunfeld that MVL plays. And it's a Russian system, a very, very, very mainline variation where white takes uh, the pawn on e6 with a check. There's queen e4 attacking the rook, black defends it. And uh, I think these guys played like 20 moves of theory or something. 
Uh, Shanklin got some interesting pressure, took on f5, e takes d4, counterattack in the middle of the board, long castle to not allow the pawn to take any of the pieces because the queen is hanging, queen moves out of the pin, bishop moves, attacking the knight, takes the bishop, the knight is still hanging, the rook moves, white is still up a piece, but um, <clears throat> I think this is a theoretical draw, and the players end this game by sacrificing a queen and forcing a draw. Yes, you saw that right, Shanklin sacks a queen to make a draw. And now Sam Shankland and uh, Wesley So win Group C and they have to play a playoff. But in Group D, there were no such playoffs. <clears throat> in Group D, there was a first the matchup between Yu Yangi and Nikita Vidigov. Eyes were on them. They both have two and a half out of five. So what's going to happen in this game? We have a Rui, actually very similar to the last position, but instead of C3, we have A4. So playing an anti-martial, uh, Yu Yangi is. Uh, this is a position actually straight from the World Championship match. Uh, and uh, exactly how Magnus played it. B4 and a rook on B8. Uh, I mean, going after this bishop. C5, taking some space. And I think, honestly, this is, this is very similar uh, to what happened between Magnus and Jan. And now we begin a gigantic explosion in the middle. Chop, chop. Chop, chop. Chop, chop. Uh, and uh, black plays bishop e6. So black has a good position. Very solid. It's really up to white to figure out how to move forward. Uh, if you try to go after d6, like with bishop f4, for example, I play b3 and your bishop is really got, just terrible. So, Vitugov uh, does exactly that. Um, puts his queen out on a5. And, uh, well, queen trade, peace trade, repetition of moves. And now they await what's going to happen between Anish Giri and Amin Tabatabe. This is all eyes are on this match. Anish Giri is the highest rated player in the section. He was the favorite going in. If he, Anish Giri is the only one who can spoil these candidates' opportunities. Uh, if he wins, and he wins the entire event, he has a chance to tie Hikaru because Anish was a semifinalist. Uh, and um, if he wins this matchup and he qualifies and wins the whole thing, then he ties. He has 20 points with reports. So still, we're not done. I told you to stick around because the recap wasn't over, right? Um, well, here you go. E4, E5, and we have Bishop C4, Bishop C5. Castles, castles. Knight D2, D6, C3, A6. Okay. Nice and calm. E4, E5 position. Here comes B4. All right. Uh, the bishop is booted. A4. Knight 2, E7. Knight G6, D4. Anish Giri is committed to winning this game. He's pushing every single one of his pawns forward as powerfully as possible, taking space on the, king, on, uh, on the center of the board and on the queen side. Rook e8. Bishop slides back to d3. Black plays c6. Okay. Anish now plays rook a3. This is a useful move because potentially the rook will join on the b attack, but also if this trade happens, the rook will be able to rotate over. So rook a3 is an interesting move. It doesn't do anything wrong to the white position. Anish plays bishop b2 and maybe wants to start playing d5 and c4. However, lurking in these positions is the fact that in every e4, e5 game, if two knights stand in front of a king, that is an indication of aggression. If two knights stand in front of a king, then at some point, one guy is going to put that knight to the flank and go to f4. Anish built up something really nice here, but he's unable to move it all forward somehow. Somehow, every move he makes comes with an issue. For example, if he plays the move b5, then black just takes twice and has absolutely no problems. Maybe he even, I don't know, plays bishop b6 and gets a rook trade first, right? It's very difficult for him to figure out what to do. a5 doesn't look too smart. It does nothing. I mean, it protects some squares, sure. So queen c2, knight h5, knight f4, and it's clear that Tabata Bay is indicating signs of aggression. Anish here can play king h2 and try to kick the knight out, but then black is going to play d5. So he decides to go like this and invite the knight in for tea time and try to trap it. The problem is that Tabata Bay chops in the center, activating just the queen and the rook in one move. Now they've both come alive. Anish takes back. And the second knight has joined the party, and this is very bad. You can only sacrifice pieces in front of your opponent's position if, and only if, you have two more attacking pieces than they have defenders. The rule of plus two. You sack a piece for one pawn. You have a queen, a knight, and a bishop, and potentially a rook, and potentially 
five pieces that are about to come to this party. Not to mention this blob that can't even get close to the white king. So Anish plays e5. The idea of e5 is that the black bishop on b8 is no longer going to participate. But now, with a tempo, comes bishop f5, and this bishop is going to participate in this attack. And here comes the rook. It is four pieces that are about to swarm this king that has a knight guarding it and barely a bishop. Are we really going to pretend like this bishop is protecting the king? I mean, let's not, let's not mess around. Knight g5 can't even protect the king. I would argue the king has no guards. I would argue the knight and the bishop together make one guard. Half a body, half a top, half a bottom, whatever. Black has four attacking pieces. Folks, the game is over. In shocking fashion, Anish is swarmed by Tabata Bay's army. The queen comes in. All sorts of mates are about to be threatened. And the final dagger to rip apart this position for, for black, uh, rip apart white's position, but for black, you'd be, so you'd be shocked. F6. What? Okay, pawn takes. I don't understand. Like, what happens if you don't take? Like, what happens if you just move your rook over? Then I take. You can't take with this because mate. You can't take with this because you lose your queen. You can't take with the queen because you get taken on f2. f6. When white takes on f6, black takes on f6. And Anish Giri resigns on his 31st move after a beautiful attacking clinic by Tabata Bay. He resigns because that the attack, he just doesn't want to, he doesn't want to see the end here. He just doesn't want to, he does, he just cuts it off right now. Tabata Bay wins group D. Anish Giri cannot make the candidates anymore. And Hikaru, the champion of group A, triumphs over everybody. And the candidates are Report and Hikaru. The final remaining spot will go to whoever replaces Sergei Karyakin. That means the person on May 1st, 2022, who has the highest rating at the end of April and has played 30 games in the last year. Right now, whoever is on this list, I don't know who it is. Let's go to Live2700. That's at 2700chess.com. 2700chess.com. That means that would be Aranyan. If you look at the current highest rated players in the world, Aranyan is number five. Carlson is the world champ. Ding Li Ren, Firuja Karawana Aranyan. If Ding Li Ren fulfills the criteria of 30 games and has a rating that is higher than 2779.2, he will make the candidates. Yeah. Congratulations to Hikaru. Absolutely unbelievable accomplishment. Um, yeah, the, I mean, he should just be incredibly proud to come back uh, from just no playing at all and from, from the start that he had in the second leg and the Twitch ban because of this, because of showing the, you know, the, the Dr. Disrespect on his stream. Uh, just crazy stuff. Absolutely crazy stuff. Massive congratulations. And um, yeah, rooting for the guy, cheering for the guy, honestly. And you just cannot deny that the competitive spirit just honestly never dies. Congrats to him again. Let me know if you guys uh, do want me to cover any more of the remaining games. There's nothing to cover. I mean, yeah, we have our results. I will see you in the next video. Get out of here.